back in July, I was contacted by Justin, and um, he, he asked would I like to participate in this conference. And then in an email of 17th of July, he suggested that I might share my experience of the work of the Citizens of Assembly with you. So that was a marker for me uh, of what might be useful. Uh, but then when the first draft agenda arrived in early September, I saw that my contribution would be a slot in a session entitled Work with Communities. Um, actually, I gave a lot of thought as to what would be useful to you. Um, you delegates working in Ireland's largest renewable sector. I came to the conclusion that it would be beneficial to demonstrate how the Citizens' Assembly, which was an exercise in deliberative democracy, enabled its members, who were members of the public, to make the recommendations which they made to the Oireachtas on the topic of climate change. I believe that the process followed in the Assembly and the outcome in relation to that topic highlights the importance of communicating with, in other words, imparting and passing on relevant information, views and advice and ideas to the public at large on the topic. Um, such approach is a necessary precursor, of course, uh, to working with the community, which is what this session is about. Um, indeed, um, as I stated in the introductory chapter in the third report of the Assembly, um, that's the report on climate change, um, I very much hope that the work of the, uh, and the recommendations made by the Citizens' Assembly can contribute to a wider public engagement and national discourse on the issue. And I really feel strongly about that. Um, but just uh, to put everything in perspective, I'm just going to say a few words, kukla fuckle, about the provenance, the function, and the structure of the Citizens' Assembly. The Assembly was established by um, a joint resolution of both houses of the Oireachtas, which was passed in July 2016. And it, 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 that stipulated that the Assembly's function was to consider, make recommendations as it should see fit, and report to both houses on the, of the Oireachtas on five topics. Um, of which the fifth topic was how the state can make Ireland a leader in tackling climate change. As to the structure, the resolution mandated that the membership of the assembly would consist of 100 persons, a chairperson to be appointed by the government, which ended up to be me, and uh, 99 citizens entitled to vote at a referendum, randomly selected so as to be broadly representative of Irish society. Those words, randomly selected so as to be broadly representative of Irish society, indicate the democratic nature of the Assembly. As to the conduct um, of the Assembly's work, the resolution provided that um, the Assembly would agree its own rules, procedure, and, uh, rules of procedure for the effective conduct of its business in as economical a manner as possible. And um, just to say en passant, um, the inaugural meeting of the Assembly was held in Dublin Castle on the 15th of October uh, 2016. That's just about two years ago. And at that meeting, the members adopted um, key principles and guidelines. And the really important principle and guideline for all of the work was openness and complete transparency. And I think that was very important. Now, there were some other provisions in the Oireachtas resolution uh, telling us what to do um, and how we would operate. Uh, it provided that um, an expert advisory group would be established to assist the work of the Assembly in terms of preparing information and advice. Also, uh, it provided that the Assembly may invite and accept submissions from interested bodies and seek expert advice as it considered desirable. Um, on the voting, it was a, a, just a question of a majority vote, and if there was equality, uh, the chair had a casting vote, but fortunately, I only had to exercise the casting vote once, and it wasn't in relation to climate change. And um, 
apart from the Eighth Amendment, um, it was provided that the government would provide the houses of the Oireachtas uh, with a response to each recommendation of the Assembly. Well, that was kind of a bit vague. And um, thankfully, uh, things have moved on since we reported on climate change. Um, in fact, the Assembly prioritised climate change um, over two constitutional topics. Um, and um, we were in a position to uh, issue our report on climate change, the third report, in April of this year. And um, this is the good news, actually. Uh, the good news is that um, in July this year, a special joint Oireachtas committee, um, in other words, of both houses of the Oireachtas, on climate change was established. And it is chaired by Deputy Hildegard Nocton, who I think may be well known in this parish. And um, it met first in July last, and it has been holding public meetings since September. And they're um, viewable on the Oireachtas um, website. Um, actually, I, I was invited to um, address the um, committee on the 5th of September last. Um, while the committee's task is to consider uh, the Assembly's third report um, and how its recommendations might inform the National Mitigation Plan, it goes beyond that. Um, in any event, it is uh, required to report to both houses not later than 31st January 2019. So there is a time frame on, on the committee's work, which I think is a good thing. Um, just um, ha having given you a little perspective of the task of the assembly, um, I will now just give you an outline of what happened on the ground. Well, first of all, we did establish the expert advisory group it consisted of one political scientist, uh, John Gary from Queen's University Belfast, who, who was with us for all of the topics. And we had five experts on climate change. And we had a very impressive uh, expert advisory group. First of all, we had Dermot Tormey, um, who's a, a lecturer in um, Dublin City University. And his research focuses on the comparative and global politics of climate change and energy. Then we had Professor Anna Davies of Trinity College Dublin. She's an expert in environmental governance, specifically fo focusing on consumption, sustainability transitions, and um, public participation in environmental decision making. Um, matters you, you, a matter you heard uh, about uh, earlier. Um, and she's also a member of the Climate Change Advisory Council. Then we had Anya Ryle from uh, University College Cork, who's a senior lecturer in environmental law in UCC and was able to assist us on any legal issues that arose. And then we had Professor Peter Thorne from Maynooth University. Um, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar with um, Professor Thorne. Uh, he was actually the lead, one, a lead author of the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's the report that's known as AR5. And um, he, he has an involvement uh, with the IPCC at present. And I was wondering last week, I wonder is he out in South Korea? He probably is, I don't know. But in any event, and then our, our, our fifth um, expert um, was Margaret Desmond. Um, and she's um, a research specialist for the EPA and also in UCC. And she's also um, very qualified in the area we were concerned with. So what do they do for us, the, the expert advisory group? Um, well, they supported me as the chair and the secretariat in constructing a fair, balanced and comprehensive um, work program and they gave us expert advice on the issues to be discussed and also which was a, a very important they identified um, specialists and experts 
to appear before the Assembly and suitable speakers from civil society and um, advocacy groups. And on every occasion um, at public meetings and um, in reports, when I've referred to the work of all of the expert advisory groups, the epithet I have used was invaluable. The, all of the expert advisory groups, and they were acting pro bono, uh, they gave really invaluable assistance to the process. Um, then uh, another part of the groundwork was that uh, the Assembly invited and accepted uh, submissions from interested bodies. Now, as, as, as is outlined in the third report, um, we uh, received over 1,200 submissions. And um, of, of that number, 1,185 were accepted and they were published on the website. All of the submissions we received were available to the members of the assembly in advance of the meetings and um, they were also available to the public at large. Um, in the case of the, the climate change topic, um, the Secretariat prepared uh, what was called a signpost document, which summarised um, the um, submissions made with a view to indicating the frequencies of the issues um, which, which arose. And um, I did a little bit of homework um, uh, and uh, I looked at the signpost document um, and I noticed that under the heading, the role of renewable energy, wind, wave, and solar, um, we did get a submission from uh, IWEA. And in fact, uh, this is summarized in the report, in, in the signpost document, um, as that uh, IWEA states that Ireland is in a very fortunate position since, since it has one of the best renewable electricity resources in the world in the form of onshore wind, wind and that Ireland has the resources, skills, knowledge and investment to lead the transition to 100% renewable en energy system by 2050, primarily based on existing technologies. And I'll just say, go uh, Ramila Mahagat IWEA for the submission. Um, now, um, the, the most important aspect of the work on the ground was the meetings of the members of the Assembly. And we had um, two weekend meetings in Malahide, one in the end of September, beginning of October 2017, and the other um, in November 2017. And in broad terms, um, the objective of the meetings was to furnish information to and um, proper information, and useful information to the members. Uh, to enable the members to discuss the issues which might give rise to recommendations. That's the deliberative element of the process. And then to identify the questions to be voted on with a view to determining uh, whether um, particular recommendations should be made. And then finally, it was voting on the questions. Um, now, at the two meetings, um, the um, members um, heard 15 experts and six individuals who had personal experiences, and they spent 26 hours in all concentrating on the issue of climate change. Um, and, and, and in fact, the topic we were given in relation to uh, climate change was framed in, in, in very, very general terms. But with the advice of uh, the expert advisory group, um, the debate was divided into four categories. First, there was, we dealt with climate change generally, matters such as the science of climate change. Uh, we heard from the UK Met Office, we heard from Met Aaron. Um, uh, we heard about the National Mitigation Plan and we heard about the Danish experience and the Scottish experience. So that was the first category. The second category was the energy sector, then the third was the transport secretary, and finally the agriculture sec se uh, sector. Um, so um, the, 
we heard in relation, I'm, I'm going to focus on the energy uh, sector. I, I, I'd love to tell you about all of the valuable um, information we got, but I'm going to focus on energy. And um, we got two papers and presentations, and the first was from Mary Donnelly, um, who um, is the director of, or was formerly the director of renewables and research and innovation uh, at DG Energy of the EU. And then we heard from Dr. Brian Motherway um, of the IEA agency in Paris, and he dealt with the future of energy. And um, we had one uh, individual telling us about wind farms, and that was uh, Paul Kenny of Tipperary um, Energy Agency. And he told us about Temple Dairy Community Wind Farm. Um, Energy also featured um, in relation to the Scottish experience and the um, <coughs> Danish experience. The speaker in relation to the Danish experience was Connie Hedegaard, who was a former European Community, uh, a, a European Commissioner on Climate Change. She, she had been in that job between 2010 and 2014. And she told the Assembly that 50% of electricity in Denmark is generated um, from energy. Uh, and then we had Professor Andrew Kerr, who's the executive director of Edinburgh Centre on Carbon in, um, Innovation. And he made some very interesting remarks. And I was quite surprised as I was sitting down there um, uh, this morning and looking at the autumn edition of Irish Wind. And in David Connolly's um, introduction, he refers to um, Professor Andrew Kerr, uh, and more or less uh, in the context of which I am about to refer to him now, I just think, I think it's worth um, quoting what, what he said. He said, there are small but vocal groups that object to the development of renewable electricity, particularly wind turbines. However, as the numbers of planned renewable developments grew, this is in Scotland now, the government increasingly explored ways of delivering benefits to communities um, affected. And um, he went on to say, he gave some examples of what the government did, and then he went on to say, there is clear evidence um, in Scotland that supporting local communities to get involved in and benefit from the local energy system enables a range of related social and economic benefits. Um, so I, th I, I, I think, I think th th that is something that would have undoubtedly weighed with the um, members of the Assembly who, who, who heard uh, from um, Professor Kerr. Um, then in other co contexts, um, the, the information in, in, in some of the other categories, the information given um, by the speakers was um, very enlightening. And I'm just going to refer to two spe other speakers, Joseph Curtin of UCC um, and um, the Institute of International European Affairs. Um, he was looking at the road ahead, and that's the, the, the terminology he used. And he focused on, and this is, a, I think, an important expression, social acceptability, and it's an important expression in, the, in this context of getting the community on side. Um, and he suggested that social acceptability is often forgotten in the debate. And he stated, and I'm going to quote from him, societal acceptance for low carbon transition is clearly a problem, particularly in rural. Some communities may see climate action as a threat to their landscape, forestry, pylons, wind turbines in, re in remote corporate ownership and to traditional economic sectors such as um, beef farming or peat. Now, he did say, and this is, this is one of his concluding remarks and I think it's very relevant, the challenge for the government is to articulate a new vision for carbon, for low carbon transition around developing green economic development. This requires incentives 
to promote low carbon business opportunities for local actors, as well as access to expertise and finance. This will take a change in mindset in many quarters, from government all the way down to the communities themselves. I think that is a very enlightening statement. Um, societal acceptance cannot, I would suggest, be achieved without communicating in a meaningful way with society. And by society, I mean the larger public. And the last uh, speaker I'm going to refer to um, spoke on the topic of um, the climate, uh, on the topic of the Climate Change Advisory Council, and no better man to speak on that because it was Dr. Professor John Fitzgerald, who was the chair of the council. And in his concluding remarks, um, he, he made observations that I think really influenced the members of the assembly. And um, he, 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 he referred in particular to the need for leadership from government and from citizens. And he also stated this, the state needs to stop supporting activities that are driving climate change and damaging to the environment. For example, subsidies for burning peat. And the state needs to ex exploit our natural renewable resources like wind and solar and, if, and ensure appropriate community involvement. Um, I, I, and as I say, I do believe that that did um, have um, an influence on the members of the assembly when they came to voting. Now, the, the voting process was divided into four categories. The first one was putting climate change in the center of policy making. Then they voted on questions in relation to energy policy, then transport policy, and finally, agriculture and land use policy. And I'm just going to refer to uh, what um, they voted in relation to energy policy, because I, I really do believe that what, what they decided and the recommendations they made reflected what they heard from the speakers. Um, and um, that is why I really do believe that um, communicating with the public on the issue of climate change is so important. Um, the first uh, recommendation was a bit uh, technical. Uh, they recommended that the state should, ena should enable, through legislation, the selling back into the grid of electricity from micro-generation by private citizens, for example, energy from solar panels or wind turbines on people's homes or land, at a price which is at least equivalent to the wholesale price. That's a bit technical. This, this is more general and I think it's very important. They also recommended that the state should act to ensure the greatest possible levels of community ownership in all future renewable energy projects by encouraging communities to develop their own projects and by requiring the developer-led projects make share offers to communities to encourage greater local involvement and ownership. Uh, while um, business may not be t t terribly keen on that particular recommendation, uh, the energy business, I mean, um, it, 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 it does indicate how people think, and I think it's important. And finally, uh, they recommended that um, the state should in, end all subsidies for peat extraction. So, um, they also made, and I'm, just, I'm almost finished, they also made some what we called ancillary um, recommendations. The um, members of the assembly indicated that uh, they wanted to make suggestions to the Oireachtas that might not have been um, voted on. And um, one recommendation they made, which I think is of particular relevance in this context, uh, they said, Greater emphasis should be placed on providing positive information to the public, which encourages people to make changes to the aspects of their behavior which impacts on climate change. Such information should be targeted at all age groups using a wide variety of formats. The information provided should be focused on highlighting the economic, social, health, and other benefits of taking action, rather than focusing on 
negatives associated with the failure to act. I think that's very enlightening. So that's what the Citizens' Assembly recommended in relation to the energy sector um, after hearing a lot of very worthwhile presentations. So where are we now? Well, as you know, the National Dialogue on Climate Action was set up in 2017, and um, it, it has already it, it, it had its first meeting in, in Athlone, I think, in June this year. And I sincerely hope that the um, National Dialogue will be supported uh, by the government and will continue to travel around the country um, because I think it's in everybody's interest that um, the uh, risks uh, of climate change and the manner in which those risks should be um, addressed um, should be uh, made known to the public at large. Thank you very much. Thank you.